In this video, I was going to discuss the effect of climate change on our polar regions, but it's turned out to be very long, so I've decided to split it into two parts. This part is about the Antarctic, and the next part is about the Arctic. I found this a particularly emotional task, having spent time in the Arctic and had the privilege of visiting the Antarctic three times on research vessels. I know that some of the landscape I visited three years ago has changed, and the amazing wildlife I saw is struggling for survival. Since the 1950s, air temperature in the Antarctic has most rapidly increased across the Antarctic Peninsula, with some warming also occurring in West Antarctic. At the moment there has been little change in the rest of the continent. For the period 1951 to 2006, the British Antarctic Survey Station at Faraday has seen an increase of 0.53 degrees Celsius per decade. The largest warming takes place in the winter, where it has increased 1.03 degrees Celsius per decade. Before I talk about the effect on the polar regions of climate change, you need to know a bit more about sea ice, ice shelves, glaciers and icebergs. Sea ice is only found in the polar regions. It is frozen ocean water that forms in the winter and melts in the summer. In some regions it remains all year round. It does not contribute to sea level rise as it melts. As ice has a bright surface, it reflects sunlight and so does not absorb much solar energy but if it has melted, then more solar energy is absorbed at the Earth's surface. Glaciers are land ice and produce icebergs when chunks of ice break off them. They are not to be confused with alpine glaciers, which are found in mountain ranges around the world. Ice sheets, also known as continental glaciers, are huge masses of glacial land ice. There are two, one covering Antarctica and the other covers most of Greenland. They form when snow falls in winter, which does not entirely melt over the summer. The ice sheets slowly flow down the hill under their own weight. When they meet the sea, the ice spreads out over the water and it is now known as an ice shelf. Ice sheets and ice shelves contain more than 99% of freshwater ice on Earth. If these melt, they do contribute to sea level rise. Global warming has caused the retreat of ice shelves on both sides of the Antarctic Peninsula and some islands that used to be covered in snow and ice are increasingly snow free during the summer. Due to changes in ocean circulation brought about by climate change, warm deep water is brought to the surface. This is affecting sea ice, which is forming later in the season and disappears faster. The ice-free season now lasts 90 days longer than it did in 1979. This warm water, when exposed to the air, increases evaporation, so there is more rain and less snow. Warmer water also affects the ice on land-attaching glaciers where they meet the sea. At least 596 of the 674 glaciers are in retreat. Increasing precipitation and premature melting of snow has huge implications for penguin species such as the dailies and gentoos who lay their eggs in nests on the ground. They build their nests out of pebbles and prefer dry rock and soil and return to the same site each year. If it rains or the snow melts, their nests become like little ponds. Their eggs will not survive in water and chicks that don't yet have waterproof feathers can become wet and die of hypothermia. A daily populations have dropped by 70%. However, gentoo pairs have increased sixfold. The reason for this is that gentoos are more adaptable. They can hunt close to land and eat whatever is available, whereas the dailies have to hunt from sea ice. Gentoos can also be flexible about where and when they make their nests and can even lay new eggs if nesting fails. Some penguins, such as emperors, need stable sea ice to lay their eggs, so if the sea ice melts, the penguins cannot breed successfully. This has already occurred at a breeding site in Halley Bay. Although the sea ice breaking up early was due to a period of abnormally stormy weather and cannot be linked directly to climate change, it does illustrate what can happen. Emperors arrive at the site in Halley Bay in April and the chicks don't fledge until December. In 2016, the ice broke up in October leading to the death of almost every chick. This pattern also occurred in 2017 and 2018. The adults now seem to have abandoned this site and have headed for a nearby colony, which is good news. The bad news, and I quote from Dr. Phil Trathan, is that existing models suggest that populations of emperor penguins will fall by 50 to 70% by the end of the century as sea ice conditions change due to climate change. Climate change is also affecting the behaviour of leopard seals. These are usually solitary creatures which stake out vast territories offshore. They rest on sea ice flows in between hunts, 
but the loss of ice means that they are changing their behaviour and are congregating near land. At Cape Sheriff Island, in the South Shetland Islands, 60 to 80 leopard seals were seen at a fur sea colony. They killed half the newborn pups, decimating the population. The colony is declining by 10% each year. Surprisingly, not all animal populations are in decline. Humpbacks are making a huge comeback. It is estimated that the population is increasing by 7-10% to per year. This is because they usually leave the Antarctic when the sea ice closes in. That used to be late March to early April. Because there are more ice-free weeks, there is more open water to move around and feed on krill. Females are now producing calves every year as the lactating mothers have so much energy they can feed newborns whilst being pregnant. Krill are mostly found in the Weddell Sea and the Antarctic Peninsula. In the past 40 years, populations have been observed to decline 70 to 80 percent. Krill need sea ice in order to breed and feed. They feed on the algae which grow on the underside of the sea ice. With the loss of sea ice, there will be less krill. I have witnessed krill feeding on algae when I dived under sea ice. I was fascinated watching them gathering up the algae into tiny little balls and then popping them into their mouths. I had to hold my breath as when I breathed the bubbles that I produced disturbed them. The correct timing of the sea ice is also important to survival as the krill use it in the winter months for shelter. As krill are food for many organisms in the Antarctic, its decline in population is of great concern. At present, scientists are unsure whether the declining krill is due to climate change or the rebound in whale populations due to the end of commercial whaling. The boom in humpback whale populations may not last for many more years. Whether krill are declining due to climate change or predation, there will eventually be a decline in humpback whale numbers due to a lack of krill. Climate change is also affecting plant life in the Antarctic. Vegetation is predominantly made up of mosses, liverworts, lichens and fungi that are specially adapted to surviving in extreme environments, in particular tolerating low temperatures and dehydration. Certain species of moss and lichen have a widespread distribution and others specialise in surviving in very extreme conditions. There are no trees found in the Antarctic and only two species of flowering plants are found. These are the Antarctic hair grass and the Antarctic pearlwort. These are only found in the South Orkney Islands, the South Shetland Islands and along the Western Antarctic Peninsula where conditions are generally warmer and wetter. Due to climate change, these flowering plants are spreading and covering more of the Antarctic Peninsula and green moss is growing three times as fast as it did in the past. Invasive grasses and lichens are also spreading. They are being brought to the Antarctic on the clothes, footwear, bags and other gear of scientists and tourists. It has been found that on average, tourists each carry two to three seeds, while scientists carry six. Rising temperatures along the Antarctic coast will likely aid these intruders' survival. Climate change in the Antarctic will also contribute to sea level rise. The glaciers on the western side of the peninsula have been monitored for a number of years, and from the mid-1900s to 2012, Ice loss from Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites Glacier has increased from 6 gigatons per year to more than 40 gigatons per year for Pine Island Glacier and 30 to 52 gigatons per year for Thwaites Glacier. This melting is due to the ice sheets being warmed from below by warm water and also the pooling of meltwater on the surface during warm summers. The sea level contribution in 1992 was 0.15 millimetres per year and in 2017 was 0.44 millimetres per year. It is estimated that if the entire marine ice shelf were to melt in West Antarctica, sea level would rise by 3.3 metres. In a recent study, it has been shown that the rate of sea level rise has been accelerating rather than increasing steadily. This is due mainly to an increase in melting of the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. At this rate, sea level will rise 65 centimetres by 2000 enough to cause significant problems for coastal cities. Thermal expansion also plays a part in sea level rise. 90% of the heat that is trapped in the atmosphere is absorbed by the oceans. This causes an increase in the volume of the water. The sea level rise produced due to this is called thermosteric sea level rise. It is estimated that between 1971 and 2010 there was a sea level rise of 0.4 to 0.8 mm per year due to this. This brings me to the end of this video and I will continue next time on the effects of climate change on the Arctic.